everyone, and welcome back to the second episode of Z Notes Live AS Chemistry. Uh, we have Fahad again, and today he will be talking about pH curves. So let's dive right into it. All right. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm back, and this time we're going to cover a second topic that has been added to the AS Chemistry syllabus, which is of pH curves. And uh, uh, before we get into pH curves themselves, I just want to do a brief recap of what acids and bases are, because um, we need to know those definitions before we get, get into the curves and how to draw them. So acids and bases. So acids are proton donors, right? Simple example is uh, hydrochloric acid, HCl, right? Uh, you can see over here it contains an H, and this is the H over here that will be donated as a hydrogen ion. And because hydrogen ions only consist of a proton in the nucleus, that's why we call it a proton donor. And bases are proton acceptors, right? So the opposite of acids. So NaOH over here is a proton acceptor. So basically what happens is this HCl will donate a hydrogen ion and the OH negative ion, the hydroxide ion in the sodium hydroxide, the base is going to accept the H plus. And so you get H2O as the product of the transfer of protons between the acid and the base, right? So that's the basic definition. Now, strong acids are a type of acid, obviously they completely dissociated to ions in water, right? So there are two ways of uh, writing this dissociation into ions. So one way is to show HCl added to water. So we can write this as plus AQ. So basically you're just making an aqueous solution of hydrochloric acid. And so it splits up into hydrogen ions, the proton that is donated and the chloride ion. Weak acids on the other hand, they only partially dissociated to ions, right? And when I say dissociate into ions, this is to release or donate hydrogen ions or protons in water, right? So another way to show this is the reaction of the acid. Over here, this is ethanoic acid. This is an example of a weak acid. And when this reacts with water itself, basically what happens is this ethanoic acid donates an H+, plus to the H2O, and that makes this H3O positive, right? So the ethanoic acid, well, it partially donates H+, plus. that means only a few molecules will actually give up their H+, plus or protons, and a lot of them are going to just stay put as whole molecules undissociated, right? And that's why we show this reaction with a reversible sign, right? There's an equilibrium between the undissociated ethanoic acid molecules and the ions that come as a result of the dissociation when added to water, right? So there are two ways of showing this dissociation, plus AQ or as a reaction with water, right? With water accepting the hydrogen ion from the acid. Now weak bases, on the other hand, they only partially accept hydrogen ions, right? So, for example, we have ammonia over here. This is a classic example of a weak base. So what happens is when you add it to water or it reacts with water, it will basically accept an H plus from the water. It's going to make NH4 positive, right? But only a few molecules of ammonia will actually accept hydrogen ions from water. The rest are going to stay put, and that's why it's a weak base. A strong base like sodium hydroxide, on the other hand, would basically all of its uh, uh, sodium hydroxides will accept H+, right? All of the hydroxide ions in NaOH, in a sample of NaOH, will accept hydrogen ions from water, and that will lead to the dissociation, the complete dissociation into ions. So this was a brief recap, and uh, one other important uh, pair of terms is the concept of a conjugate base and conjugate acid, right? So if I use this equation over here, I have HCl, that is an acid, 
once it donates an H plus to the ammonia, we convert it into Cl negative, right? Now, once the HCl has behaved as an acid and donated its proton, the chloride ion is the conjugate base, right? So once the acid has donated its proton, what you're left with is a conjugate base. And similarly for this base over here, NH3, once it accepts a hydrogen ion, once it has done its job as a base, you are left with NH4 positive, which is the conjugate acid, right? And the reason why we switch these terms around, conjugate acid and conjugate base, is because if I look at the reverse reaction, the NH4 positive is actually going to donate an H plus back to the Cl negative. So NH3 was a base. And in the reverse reaction, the NH4 positive is behaving as an acid, right? That is why the base, when it accepts a proton, it is converted into conjugate acid. And when an acid donates a proton, it is converted into a conjugate base. Hopefully this uh, pair of terms was not too confusing. Uh, hopefully you understood this as well, Ethan. Yep. So, all right. So let's move on to the topic for today, which is the pH curve. So the very important thing that we want to deal with first when you talk about pH curves is an indicator, right? The indicators are usually weak acids and they change color depending on the pH of the solution, right? So over here, I have a weak acid H in. So basically uh, I've written it like this so that it can be split up into a hydrogen ion and this associated anion, right? And this is a weak acid. So we show this reversible sign. Only a few of the molecules will actually dissociate into ions and the rest will stay put. Right? Now the thing is that uh, the undissociated molecules have a different color and the associated anion over here will have a different color. So these two differently colored substances, the molecule and the anion are in equilibrium, right? And uh, if you change the concentration of hydrogen ions, obviously the position of equilibrium will shift and so the color of one of these guys will dominate. And that's what you will see. And we'll get into that detail later. First, some examples of indicators. We have this entire list. And, uh, well, you don't need to remember all of these, right? But uh, because these uh, indicators and their pH ranges and their color changes will be given to you. But... Uh, I normally advise my students to at least remember three of these, right? Because they come up more often. So one is methyl orange, and one is bromothymol blue, and one is phenolphthalein, right? So these three indicators, I mean, if you remember their colors and their pH ranges, that would be, uh, that would be good for you, right? So basically what this tells us, this pH range is that uh, if I have a solution at a pH less than the lower limit of 3.2 in the case of methyl orange, the methyl orange will be red, right? Mm -hmm. And if I add a base and increase the pH such that it goes beyond uh, 3.2 and goes into this range between 3.2 to 4.4, the color will start to change from red to yellow. And beyond the upper limit of 4.4, you will get a permanent yellow color right? So between this range of 3.2 and 4.4, the color will change from red to yellow. And uh, in the middle, you will get an orange color, obviously. So that's why we call this methyl orange, right? So this is what all of this means. And you can see the list and the color changes and the pH ranges for all the indicators here. Right. So now this equilibrium between the undissociated molecules and the anion is important, right? Now, if I were to add an acid, if I were to add an acid, the thing is that in this equilibrium over here, it's the concentration of this, the hydrogen ions that will go up, right? 
Its concentration of hydrogen ions will go up. And so according to Le Chatelier's principle, the position of equilibrium needs to shift so that we can bring down the H plus back to its original level. And so for that, equilibrium will shift to the left. And so the color of the and associated molecules will dominate, right? And similarly, if I were to look at this equilibrium again, and if I were to add a base to this, then what would happen? The thing is, if I write this down here again, H I N, H plus and I N minus, when I add a base, the concentration of H plus will obviously go down. The reason is the H plus from over here will be reacting with the hydroxide ions from the base and will be neutralized, right? And so the concentration of hydrogen ions will go down. So Ethan, simple question. Where yeah. would the equilibrium position shift for this? What do you think? So the uh, hydrogen ion decreases the concentration. Right. So uh, where do you think the equilibrium will shift? To well, it would shift right to like... Exactly. To the right. It will shift to the right. And so the color of the associated anion will dominate, right? So in the case of yeah. adding the acid, the color of the undissociated molecule will dominate. And this is for acidic conditions in an acidic solution the color of the molecule shows up and in basic solution the color of the anion shows up so this is basically the whole concept of an indicator and how it works right now let's get on to the ph curve itself now there are a couple of points uh, on the ph curve that are of prime importance. Uh, so the first point is the end point, right? Indicators are used to indicate the end point of titrations by changing color, right? Um, the end point, if I were to define this, it's basically the, um, it's the point on the pH curve at which the indicator starts to permanently change its color, right? So depending on the indicator, you will have a different end point, right? Because they have different pH ranges, right? So uh, methyl orange has a different pH range, phenolphthalein has a different pH range. And so according to those pH ranges, you're going to have different end points on the same pH curve, depending on the indicator, right? End point is a property of the indicator, right? Now, the other point on the pH curve is the equivalence point. Now the equivalence point is the actual uh, point at which the acid and base have completely neutralized each other, right? When the acid and base have been added in such quantities that they have completely neutralized each other's effect, that point on the pH curve at which this happens is the equivalence point, right? So you have these two points. And when these two points are close to each other, the end point and the equivalence point that tells us the indicator is a suitable indicator for the titration, right? And uh, we look at how this works using some examples and the ca different cases of pH curves, right? So the first case is of a strong acid and a strong base. So uh, let's say we have HCl and NaOH, strong acid and strong base. So Starting pH is obviously very low due to the uh, HCl. Now, the thing is, uh, you can plot pH curves in different ways. Uh, what I have used in these slides is, uh, you know, we have kept the acid in the conical flask, right? And we are adding the base to it. We're dropping the base from the buret, right? And we're measuring the pH in the conical flask. So obviously, when the conical flask has acid in it to begin with, the starting pH will be pretty low. And then the pH rises slowly when you add base to it, 
And then when the equivalence point is close, there's a sharp jump in the pH. And this is because when the equivalence point is reached, all of the acid has been neutralized by the base. And once you add excess base, the pH is going to suddenly jump because there is no neutralization going on anymore. Right. So the curve looks something like this, right? Started at a low pH due to the acid in the conical flask. And on the x-axis, I have the volume of the base added, right? So obviously when I add base, the pH will increase slowly at first because there's some acid still left to be neutralized. But once the acid has been completely neutralized or is close to being completely neutralized, a little bit of base added is going to lead to a sudden jump in pH, this vertical section that you can see over here, and then it will finally level off, right? And the midpoint of this vertical section you can see is at a pH of seven, right? This midpoint is actually called the equivalence point, right? The midpoint of the sharp jump or the vertical section of the pH curve, that is called your equivalence point. That is the point at which the acid and base have completely neutralized each other, right? And if I um, you know, read this equivalence point, it's uh, X coordinate, it gives me a volume of close to 25. So basically that is the volume of sodium hydroxide, the base that I needed to add to neutralize the strong acid, which is HCl in the conical flask, right? And uh, now the thing is, if I want to use a suitable indicator, I want to make sure that its pH range lies within the vertical section. So over here, I have uh, two indicators for reference. I have methyl orange and phenolphthalein, right? Methyl orange obviously was red below this range. Uh, when you added the base to it, it turned yellow, right? And you can see that its pH range, 3.2 to 4.4, lies within this vertical section. And for phenolphthalein, the same case over here, below this pH range of 8.2 to 10, it was colorless. Yes. And above this, it becomes pink, and so I've colored it pink, right? So when the pH range yes. of an indicator lies within the vertical section of a pH curve for a given acid-base titration, then it is a suitable indicator. Why? Because the end point the point at which the indicator changes color and the equivalence point are so close to each other that they're going to give you pretty much the same volume of base added at um, neutralization, at complete neutralization. So if I were to just uh, zoom in on this part a little, let's say I have this pH curve, right? This is your equivalence point. This gives us a certain volume on the x-axis, the volume of base added. And let's say that the range of the pH of an indicator is somewhere over here. So the color change started over here for the indicator. And so this over here is your equivalence point. And yeah. this point over here, if you can see this, this is an end point. And you can see that the volumes of the base added at the end point and equivalence point are very close to each other. And so that makes this indicator suitable, right? So the golden rule is if the pH range of color change for an indicator lies on the vertical section of the pH curve, it's a suitable indicator because the indicator's end point and the equivalence point of this acid-base titration, the equivalence point of the pH curve are so close that the volume of base added is almost the same for both, right? And that's why the indicator is suitable, all right? So yep. this was the case of strong acid and strong base. Now the case of a strong acid and the weak base is slightly different. Strong acid, for example, we have HCl again, 
weak base, for example, ammonia. So let me just display these points. Now over here, the only difference is that uh, the equivalence point is going to actually occur at a pH less than seven. Now this uh, defies logic at first because obviously you would think that equivalence point is the point at which acid and base completely neutralize each other. But how is it that the equivalence point is occurring at a pH less than seven? I mean, you would think that complete neutralization leads to pH of seven, but in this case, it does not, right? So the equivalence yeah. point is at a pH less than seven in the case of a strong acid and weak base. Now, normally students, they uh, come up with the intuition that, you know, we have a strong acid and a weak base. So it's the strong acid that pulls down the equivalence point to a pH less than seven. But, well, that may work, uh, but the actual scientific reason is a little different than this. We're going to go into that a little later. But first, let's look at the indicators for this. Now you can see over here that the pH range for methyl orange lies within the vertical section, but for phenolphthalein, if I were to extend this over here, the upper limit and the lower limit, the lower of 8.2, the upper of 10, you can see that the pH range of color changes above this vertical section right here. So as a result, the equivalence point of the pH curve and the end point of phenolphthalein are going to be far apart, right? The volume at the equivalence point is somewhere over here, close to 25. But uh, if I were to uh, draw a line to the x-axis, the volume axis, from the lower end of the pH range of phenolphthalein, if I to go all the way down over here, you can see that the difference is of almost five cubic centimeters in the volume of the base added. It's too much, right? So this phenolphthalein is unsuitable for this titration because its pH range of color change lies beyond the vertical section of the pH curve. Methyl orange, on the other hand, is very much suitable for this. All right. Now, on to the reason of why the pH at the equivalence point is less than 7. And the reason is, if you look into the reaction between NH3 and HCl, you will notice that they will react to give you this guy over here, NH4 positive. Now, this NH4 positive happens to be a weak acid itself, right? The weak base, NH3, when it accepts a hydrogen ion from the HCl, it forms its conjugate acid. And the conjugate acid in this case, NH4 positive, is going to make the solution slightly acidic at the complete neutralization. Because the salt that is being formed, ammonium chloride, has a cation, NH4 positive, that itself is slightly acidic. It's a weak acid itself. And so because of the presence of this weak acidic cation in the salt at neutralization, we have a pH of less than seven at the equivalence point. All right. Now, on to the next case. We have a weak acid and a strong base. So weak acid can be any organic acid. For example, ethanoic acid, we have CH3COOH. And we have a strong base, for example, sodium hydroxide. So the shape of the curve is something like this, right? And uh, over here, you can notice that uh, the starting pH was slightly higher at a pH of three rather than one because the acid is weak. The acid that is in the conical flask is weak. And then we add the strong base from the buret to it during the titration. Now the equivalence point over here is greater than seven. It is a pH of eight, right? Equivalence point yeah. is greater than seven. Is that a pH greater than seven? And the reason is, well, again, the intuition follows that, you know, we have a strong base and a weak acid. And so the strong base pulls up the pH to greater than seven at the equivalence point. 
Uh, by the way, the pH at the equivalence point, there's a very easy way of finding it out. Uh, what you can do is just uh, take the pH at the bottom of the vertical section and the pH at the top and just take their average, right? And once you do that, you can get the, um, the pH at the equivalence point, right? So over here, I mean, we have a pH of, um, okay, so we have a pH of eight over here, right, at the equivalence point. So now let's look at the indicator. Now methyl orange over here has a pH range of 3.2 to 4.4. And if I extend this back to the Y axis, you can see that the pH range of color change for methyl orange does not overlap with the vertical section over here, but it does so for phenolphthalein. And so phenolphthalein is suitable, whereas methyl orange is not. And the reason is that uh, if you increase the pH, the color change for methyl orange will start so early on in the process that it is so much lower than the pH at the equivalence point, which is close to 25. This volume over here is close to zero. So it doesn't make any sense. So methyl orange does not fit this particular titration. It's going to be phenolphthalein, mm -hmm. right? Okay. And now for the reason as to why the pH is greater than seven at the equivalence point of a weak acid strong base titration is that if you look at the reaction between the two, the ethanoic acid over here, when it donates an H plus to the hydroxide ion in NaOH, it forms this guy over here, the ethanoic ion. Now the ethanoic ion, itself is a weak base, right? So the weak acid, once it's done being an acid, it forms a conjugate base that happens to be a weak base itself. And so because of the presence of this weak base uh, in the salt at neutralization, we have a pH that is slightly greater than seven at the equivalence point when the complete neutralization has occurred, right? So the CH3CO negative is the anion of the salt, sodium ethanoate, and uh, the anion happens to be basic. And so because of that, the equivalence point will have a pH greater than seven in this case. Now, finally, the last case is of a weak acid and a weak base. Now this curve is going to be more different than the others in the sense that it does not really have a vertical section. You can see that uh, this part of the graph is a little tilted, right? And uh, this tilt over here actually makes sure that for a weak acid and a weak base, uh, for example, ethanoic acid as your weak acid and ammonia as your weak base, this tilt over here, this non-vertical section is going to ensure that no matter what indicator you use, it's going to be useless. The reason is that uh, for one thing, this uh, section is sh so short that uh, it's not going to overlap with the pH range of any indicator. So not with methyl orange, not with phenolphthalein. And even if, for example, we had an indicator that overlapped with this uh, non-vertical section, if you will. For example, let's say we have bromothymol blue which has this pH range of 6 to 7.6, 6 to 7.6. It overlaps with the vertical section, but the thing is that uh, the pH starts to change color. The indicator starts to change color over here. And the equivalence point is over here. So the difference between them is of a few cubic centimeters, right? So there's a difference yeah. of of a few cubic centimeters, and even that is unacceptable when we talk about acid-based titrations, when you're working with a burette that uh, has an accuracy of a half a cubic centimeter, this is not going to cut it. Sorry, 0 0.1 cubic centimeters. This is not going to be acceptable, right? If you have a difference of a few cubic centimeters between the volume obtained at the end point 
with the indicator changed color and the volume obtained at the equivalence point when the complete neutralization occurred. So that is why a weak acid and weak base, this kind of titration cannot take place using an indicator. You would have to use a pH meter for this. And uh, normally pH meters are not that easily available in school labs, at least where I come from. So this is, um, this is basically it regarding uh, pH curves. So uh, any questions from your side, Ethan, before we go into the workout? Uh, nope, I'm fine. All right. So now let's go into the uh, types of questions that you can uh, expect. Again, because this is an A2 topic that has been added to the AS syllabus now. So I have selected questions from paper four of the A2 syllabus, right? Uh, but questions of this uh, topic do not come up that frequently, but it's still an important topic. Um, one type of question that can come up is pretty straightforward. Uh, over here, it gives us two uh, titration curves or pH curves, right? On the y-axis, we have the pH, as we have already seen. And on the x-axis, we have the volume. Now, remember, uh, the curves that I have uh, given you earlier were with volume of base added, right? So we started with a low pH of the acid in the conical flask, and then the pH increased because we were adding base. Now we're doing the opposite. We have the base in the conical flask. We're adding acid to it. And so the pH was high at first, and then it went down eventually, right? So this is the kind of pH curve that can also come up. So over here, we're adding acid. It says use the titration curve for reaction M to reduce the volume of acid added at the end point for this titration, right? So over here, because you have a vertical section, right? You have a vertical section. So this means that this is not going to be a weak acid, weak base titration. And uh, as a result, the volume at the end point if you use a suitable indicator, and the volume at the equivalence point are going to be the same, right? So what I need to do is for reaction M, I look at the titration curve. I have this vertical section. I'm going to extend this vertical section down to the x-axis, and I'm going to read off the volume of the x-axis. Over here between 20 and 30, I have five small squares. So this is 22, 24, 26, 28. So this volume at the end point, which is the same as the equivalence point if you use a suitable indicator for this titration is going to be 28 cubic centimeters. Pretty straightforward. But the next question is also pretty straightforward. It says the table shows some acid-base indicators. Name a suitable indicator for each of the acid-base titrations. Explain your answers, right? Now, I'm going to go back to those curves. What I'm going to do is I'm going to read the pH values of the y-axis at the beginning and the end of the vertical sections. So over here in reaction M, the vertical section begins somewhere over here. All right. And so I'm going to read this pH of the y-axis. Now I have one, two, three, four, five small squares between eight and 10. So that means each small square represents 0 0.4. So this is 8.4, 8.8, right? Yeah. And the end of the vertical section is somewhere over here. So this is a pH of four. So from a pH of four to 8.8, .8, now I want to ensure that I use an indicator whose pH range of color change lies within this four to 8.8. .8 range of the vertical section. So if I had note this down over here for reaction M, this is 4 to 8.8. .8. And so, Ethan, which uh, indicators do you think lie within this range that I have mentioned over here? Uh, Bromophile blue. Right, so bromothymol blue, correct? Yeah. That lies in this range. And uh, yeah, 
Time off to lead though is beyond this range. Yeah. So we can't use this. Bromo Crisol Green. Well, it is within the range, but it starts at a pH that is slightly below. Slightly below four. Yeah. And so not really going to go with this one. And this is right. way below the pH range. And so I'm going to use Bromo Thymol Blue for this one. Now, if I do the same for reaction N, now over here, the vertical section begins over here at this higher pH of, um, now again, we have the same scale. So this is going to be 11.6, right? Each small square is 0 0.4 in terms of pH. And so one small square below 12 will be 11.6. And the vertical section ends somewhere over here. So this is going to be 5.6. So 5.6 to 11.6 is the range for reaction N. Write this down over here. 5.6 to 11.6. Now for this, um, if I look at these uh, pH ranges for the color change of each indicator, uh, malachite green is not going to cut it because again, it's too low. Uh, Bromocresol green, again, below the range. Bromothymol blue can work again. And in this case, thymolphthalene can also work. So you can use either of these indicators for this particular um, titration. And uh, because of the fact that uh, bromothymol blue, it's uh, lower end of its pH range, six, is a little too close for comfort to this 5.6. So I'd rather go with thymolphthalene for this one because that's well within the range, well inside the range of the um, vertical section of the pH curve, right? So the explanation is very simple. Uh, their pH ranges of color change lie within the respective vertical sections of the pH curves for reaction M and reaction N. So that will make the end point of the indicator at which it changes color close enough to the equivalence point of the titration so that we get the correct volume of uh, acid added. Right. Now this question over here um, is slightly uh, different in the sense that uh, it uses a concept that was uh, actually, that is actually taught in A2, but uh, because now it's part of the AS syllabus, so I'm just going to briefly touch upon this concept that may be helpful in some questions that may come across. So over here you can see yeah. that we have a titration curve or pH curve for sodium hydroxide being added to ethanoic acid. So this is a titration of a weak acid and a strong base. So in the region circled on the graph, identify the two organic species that are present in the solution. Explain why the pH of the mixture only changes slowly and gradually in this region when sodium hydroxide is being added. Okay. So in this particular region, what is happening is that uh, some of the ethanoic acid is reacting with sodium hydroxide to give you the salt, right? To give you water and the salt, which is sodium ethanoid. So I'm going to write this as CH3COONA. So the organic species that are present over here, first of all, it's the ethanoic acid that still has to react, right? So it is this guy over here. This is our first organic species. The second organic species is this particular ion, right? This ethanoate ion that is part of the salt that has been formed by that small part of the ethanoic acid that has reacted with the sodium hydroxide that has been added so far, right? Now, as for the reason of why the pH changes slowly, is because of the fact that uh, you have some of the uh, ethanoic acid still left, right? 
And actually, the presence of this weak acid and this iron, which, by the way, is the conjugate base. This is the conjugate base of ethanoic acid. Um, when you have a weak acid and its conjugate base, that gives you a type of solution that you'll study the details of uh, in A2. But this is actually going to be called a buffer solution. And a buffer solution, the definition that you need to know is buffer solution resists changes to pH. Right? And the reason why is you have this particular equilibrium between the weak acid and its conjugate base. We know that a weak acid is an equilibrium with its conjugate base because it only partially dissociates, right? So you have a considerable concentration of the weak acid because it's undissociated. Very little of it actually dissociates to give you the ions. And you have a considerable concentration of the conjugate base because of the presence of the salt, right? So this is from the salt. And this is the undissociated acid right so because we have a large concentration of undissociated acid that will react with the base this will react with the base added and somehow if you were to add some acid the conjugate base would react with it This is if it is added. So basically, you have these two species that are in equilibrium with each other, the weak acid and the conjugate base. You have a considerable concentration of both, the weak acid because a lot of it is undissociated, the conjugate base because of the salt that has been formed so far uh, by the reaction of NaOH and CH3CO2H. And uh, if you were to add a small amount of base, that would react with the weak acid. If you were to add a small amount of acid, that would react with the conjugate base. And so this is a buffer solution that resists changes to pH. And because it resists changes to pH, the pH will change only very slowly when you add sodium hydroxide, right? But once you add enough sodium hydroxide to get rid of all of the CH3CO2H, and neutralize it completely, then the buffer solution is no longer existing. And so the excess NOH that you add will lead to this vertical section, this sudden jump in the pH, all right? This concept was a little confusing, a little detailed, but uh, hopefully you have understood this um, from this question, right? Yep. All right. Now it says, suggest why the pH is greater than seven at the equivalence point in this titration, uh, they're asking about the same titration that we were doing earlier, and they've given the definition of equivalence point. It's the point where the two solutions have been mixed in exactly equal molar proportion, right? Basically, enough uh, base has been added to ne completely neutralize the acid. Now, the pH is greater than 7, obviously, because of the presence of the weak weakly basic CH3 COO negative in the salt formed after complete neutralization. This we had already covered with the example in our deep dive. Yeah. All right. Now, finally, um, this is a more recent paper. Uh, in the Feb March series. Um, according to the new syllabus, this was the first paper, oh. and uh, the question came up regarding the drawing of uh, pH curves, right? Now, it's going to be pretty simple. All we need to do is uh, look at the reaction. So, the first reaction is between sodium hydroxide and HBr, right? Now, oh. HBr, like HCl, is a strong acid. This is a strong acid, right? Now, 
we have a, a titration between a strong acid and a strong base. So strong base and strong acid. So we need to make sure that, first of all, at what volume will the equivalence point occur, right? Now, if I write down the equation for the reaction between these two guys, I will notice that I need a one-to-one -one molar ratio between sodium hydroxide and HBr to completely neutralize and balance this equation. So I have a one-to-one -one molar ratio. So if I have the same concentration of NaOH as HBr, and I have 25 cubic centimeters of HBr, I will have the same volume of NaOH, which is 25 cubic centimeters. So this is where the equivalence point will occur for this particular titration, right? And I'm adding NaOH. So what we have initially is the acid. So I start at a low pH for that acid. pH of one will be good enough, right? And the vertical section will occur at a volume of 25 cubic centimeters for sodium hydroxide. That's where the equivalence point occurs. And I need to make sure that the vertical section has a midpoint of seven for this titration between strong base and strong acid. Right. Now, the midpoint of the vertical section is your equivalence point, pH. Right. And so I need to pick two numbers that will give it the average of seven. Right. So. Yeah. I could go with is, uh, for example, let's say I go with uh, a pH of 10 at the top and a pH of 4 at the bottom. So 10 plus 4 divided by 2 will give me 7, right? So at a volume of 25 cubic centimeters added at the equivalence point, I would want the vertical section to have these three points starting, midpoint, and point right so this is your vertical section and obviously the ph is going to tail off over here and it's going to be a slow increase over here from the low ph right so this is your first ph curve second ph curve is between nh3 now this is a weak base and hbr obviously is your strong acid and if I write down the equation between these two, again, I will notice that I would need just a one-to-one -one molar ratio to balance the equation. So I have one-to-one -one molar ratio. And so if I have 0 0.1 molar or mole per cubic decimeter HBr, and I have the same concentration of aqueous ammonia, and I have 25 cubic centimeters of HBr, I will need the same volume of NH3 to neutralize it because of the one-to-one -one ratio. So again, 25 cubic centimeters will be the volume at the equivalence point. Now the midpoint of this has to be not at a pH of seven, but at a pH less than seven because this is a weak base versus strong acid. So pH of less than seven, let's say, I go with six, right? I need to choose two numbers that will give me an average of six, the starting point and the ending point of the vertical section. So let's say I go with a pH of four to start and a pH of eight to end with. So eight plus four divided by two gives me six. So I have the starting point over here of the vertical section at a volume of 25, yep. the midpoint, at six and the ending point at eight. So this is our vertical section. Uh, I'm going to start with the low pH of one again because we have a strong acid to which the base is being added. So this is going to be somewhere over here. And over here, it is going to tail off at a lower pH, right? Over here, you had a strong base. So the so the pH that was being achieved at the end was close to 12. And over here, the pH that is being achieved in, with excess of ammonia is around 10, right? So that shows mm -hmm. us that we have a weak base that we are adding, and that's what has been added in excess. And so over here, this is your 
equivalence point at the oh. point, the vertical sections midpoint at the end of this whole exercise. So this was our workout. So in summary, uh, pH curves, um, you need to be aware of indicators and how they work and which indicators are going to be suitable for a given titration. Uh, you need to be aware of the four different cases of titration, uh, the combination of strong and weak acids and bases, right? And uh, how the shape will basically occur on that graph. Y-axis is for pH, X-axis can be volume of acid added or volume of base added. You need to be careful uh, with regards to that X-axis. So the uh, pH might rise if you're adding base or it may fall if you're adding acid instead. And uh, obviously you need to be able to draw pH curves like this, like we just drew. And uh, you need to be able to understand what is going on during each part of the titration of, between an acid and a base. So that is all for uh, pH curves. Uh, if you have any questions, do leave them in the comments. All right. All right. Uh, thank you for hard for making this tutorial on pH curves. Um, so in the next episode uh, of Xenos Live of ASCAM, uh, what would we be going over? Okay. So in the next topic, um, now these were the two topics that were added from A2 to AS. So these were the relatively new topics. Uh, the next topic uh, I want to cover is an A2 topic, right? If, okay, uh, if that's yeah. all right. Um, yeah, that's fine. Okay, so that A2 topic is actually um, proton NMR, right? It's an analytical technique and uh, it comes up in pretty much every single paper. And uh, uh, it still is a pretty confusing topic for many. Uh, personally, even I used to struggle with this when I was a student. So uh, I would really want to dive into that particular topic in the next one. Sounds good? Right, yeah, that sounds interesting for, especially it would help those doing A2 or just people interested in just chemistry in general, I guess. Definitely. So um, stay tuned for next week. Um, see you then, bye. All right, bye.